We live in a fantasy world now. Reality has been destroyed. This is the time that you really need to pay attention. The probabilities are overwhelmingly on gold's side. That is the best environment to see gold increase its value. Welcome to Palisades Gold Radio. I'm your host, Tom Bodrovix. Joining me today is John Lee. He's a chartered financial analyst with 20 years experience in the mining industry and a passion for studying the financial markets. John, thanks for joining me today. Good to be back, Tom. Uh, Lincoln and I, it's almost been two years since I come on the show. That last was, I think, September 2022. Absolutely. It's, it's again, it's always crazy. I know I always say this. I'm sure the audience that listens to, you know, the majority of episodes gets probably tired of hearing this, but you know, it's always crazy to me to catch back up with somebody and realize how long it's actually been since the last time we spoke and, and how many things have actually changed. You know, we're, we're going to touch on a lot of those today, obviously, but maybe we can start by asking you since the last time we spoke, what you got right, what you got wrong, maybe what surprised you the most over the last two years. Uh, good start. If I just go down the list in the five minutes that I reviewed our interview prior to this call today, I recall mentioning about this Russian sanction. It's not going to end until Putin is removed from the helm and same with Xi Jinping. And that what we see today is, is a replay deja vu of the opium market. That's an opium war. That's 150 years ago. It's not about democracy versus, versus dictatorship. It's the same people that's driving the post right now. Too naive at this point to think that the president of the U.S. and president of Canada are, are formulating policy for the good of their own, own countrymen. And since then, the war has gotten a lot worse and it's not going to get better. I also talked about the silver market being irrational at that time. I think silver is on $18 is very much undervalued. But I said that it's largely retail driven and it could stay irrational then longer than it can stay solvent. And, uh, you know, silver went on at $20 level for close to, well, close for one and a half years until its breakout in, in early 2024. I also talked about, I'm being a, I'm not a dollar bear, I'm a dollar bull. And the dollar actually, since we talked, I think it's 107, jacked up to 114 mm-hmm. right after our call and it's settling right about 104, 105 right now. I think it's gonna head it higher. And the reason being is, is that all the currencies are now centralized. All the central banks are support, all the currencies are supporting to the dollar. They're all fiat, and there's no longer a commodity currency or a safe haven play versus all these different ways. So the dollar, the call was on dollar is also quite correct. We also talked about the title of our last interview was uh, World Demographics that Derailed the Commodity Super Cycle. At that time, the oil was about $85, $90. It never really went about back up over 90 and I was trading in the low 70s right now. Uh, Even despite the cuts that OPEC has announced. Yeah, just despite the cuts for rice. And then also that's despite the ban on fracking with the United States. Mm-hmm. So that just shows you that the fundamentals is actually a lot wor- even worse than what is being reflected in the market. Then if you even look at the worst performer for the metals, which I was never, I was not a bull of the PGM. Palladium actually went down more than 50% from $2,000 to now less than 1000 So that just tells you that across the board, the lackluster demand in the auto sector. Even in the in the EV sector, there's been show signs of weakness looking at the current uh, bearish of the nickel price and that the warnings and a massive consolidation in the EV sector in China. So all in all, I also talked about inflation is going to persist. The risk is going to go a lot higher. Back then, the race when we are in September 2022 was about 10 years, about three and a half percent. And I was talking about the two years going to go to five percent. It touched briefly on five percent. It's hovering around that range. And the 10 year right now is at four, four and a half percent. I think the race is going to go a lot higher. This scenario of the inverted yield curve, which I came on a show just a week ago. Right now, we're in the yield yield curve, which is 10 year yield is, is less than a two year, which doesn't make any sense whatsoever. Inflationary environment, you're going to have to demand higher interest payment, right? For having your money locked up in a longer term. Like the market is going to come to an epiphany moment very, very soon. In the past, it's always been the inverted yield curve signals recession, and the Fed is then going to turn around and aggressively lower interest rate to normalize the yield curve. I think this time around, the risk is not going to come down. And the only way to normalize the yield curve is that this loan race is going to jump over the fence and go up to much higher levels. So all, I think all of all the macro things are being largely correct. The, the, the areas where I was a little surprised, I was more bearish than, than the market were, were the equity market. We can talk about that because 
you know, I was mentioning if the yield would double or triple, then the, the market is going to endure a heavy correction unless they jack up the dividend rate, double or triple. Mm -hmm. So now we're seeing still S&P and, and, and NASDAQ, they're breaking out to, to record high, especially in the NASDAQ in the face of a rising dollar, which doesn't make a whole lot of sense. And the other area I was wrong is uranium. And I still couldn't figure it out. <laughs> it's not the first time. It's not the last time. Because in, in terms of the world, nuclear power production has been trading down. It's not trading up. And more nuclear plants are being decommissioned than there are ones that are being commissioned. New power plants that's being put into operation. I was wrong. I don't know that market well enough, apparently. And so that's a market I stay away from. And same with the equity market. Every time we try to short, um, we, we, get, we, uh, we lose money. So... I think there's some theory as to why that is the case, and we can obviously delve into that. Yeah, obviously, there's a, a lot to kind of pick up on there, John. Maybe we can start by talking about interest rates. You know, obviously, many people at the beginning of this rate hiking cycle, the steepest and quickest in the U.S.'s history, right, and and of biggest magnitude. Nobody thought that that was going to be sustainable. Everybody or most people, let's say, thought. That that was going to crash the markets, even if you take into consideration the the variable lags that interest rates start to affect the market through, there was a consensus that that was just going to wreck everything. So why do you think that that it didn't at, at this point? You know, we're, we're over two years past that, past the start of the rate hiking cycle. Well, Tom, first of all, the trajectories for the rates are going a lot higher. Mm -hmm. The Treasury bull market. We have had a 40-year treasury bull market that came to an end in 2020, 2021. When the, when the interest rate went from 15 to 20% in 1980 to, to 1.5% for 10 years in 2021, that has come to an end. That's a very definitive, even a 10-year-old preliminary first-year financial charters can, can tell you that it is a clear definitive breakout by the yields. We can talk philosophically and technically if the Fed needed an excuse to lower the rates, they would have done so already. Let's look at it. You have the wars that's breaking out, right? Remember back in the days, like when the Korean fought a missile and, and that's not even somewhere somewhere in the Pacific Ocean and the Fed's talking about dropping interest rate. And the slightest hint of distress in the banking sector, <laughs> you know, the, 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 the Feds are eager to drop rates. Mm -hmm. and, and then every time they're... And, 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 I remember the days when oil went to 120, 130, 150. And then, and the Fed is saying, oh, the inflationary bank can, can stay flexible and that we're still, the inflation is, expectation is still very low, right? For all the reasons that the pretext that the Fed is ever in a place that is, 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 it should be lowering interest, it would have done so already. And uh, so clearly, technically, and also the Fed speaking is giving you a very clear picture for those who are really listening on, the, on that this time is very, very different. You can also listen to what the Fed is saying. You know, this guy called Neil Kalakari, I think is the governor, Fed governor of Michigan or Minnesota. Seven years ago, they said, oh, you know what? The Fed can, can stay put, this inflationary bank can stay but lose, even there's uptick in inflation, even oil is $120. We're still we're still very concerned about the deflation, the D word, and the lack of consumer spending and, and the lack of you know job creation. And now they're the same person, Tom. They're saying just to show you, right? They're being fed a diet, not coming up with their own baselines. Now they're saying that they gotta the Fed is gonna wait for a, a few more quarters of evidence of cooling inflation before they can even begin to consider lowering the interest rates. And now the market seems to be relieved that the Fed is not contemplating an interest rate, interest rate hike. Gradually, the market is coming to a realization, but the message is very clear to me that the rates are going a lot higher. And then if you also to hear the likes of some of these WEF controlee that to say, like Macron of France, three years ago, came out and said the good times are over, and you're wondering what, what he's referring to. So all in all, the rates are going higher. And what is surprising, though, is it hasn't wreaked the sort of havoc that, that you would have expected to see in the housing market, because that is very interest rate sensitive, and also in the equity market, which is competing for dollars with the dividend yield as opposed to risk-free yield. So would you imagine if the risk-free rate were to double like we have experienced, then the equity should be halved if it was if we were to provide the same dividend. So right now we're at a no-speed territory on a, on a risk-free basis. 
And the only reason I can come up with, <laughs> there's only one reason, is there are some people that are not playing by the rules. And they're not, they're not sensitive to the interest rates. They have a different qualification requirements than the ordinary people. And a more blunt way to putting at it is the currencies that are being printed have their face on it. They are the king of the castle like it was a thousand years ago. And their wealth is ma not measured by the fiat that they own or the interest rate. They're not affected by the interest rates. And take total evidence that you see my point about they are just buying these assets uh, because they have control of the printing press is today up to 60 to 80% of the S&P 500 is owned by the vanguards, the, the, the BlackRock and the State Streets. Who are these people coming? They can say, oh, it's a plunge protection team, or it could be the ETS. Like nobody has that kind of war chest on the to the tunes of hundreds of billions of dollars on a weekly basis. I think that's a very clear sign you have some invisible hands. The guys that have been that that were responsible for making the war go around, they're still the same people with their grandparents and with their hairs that are that are buying the market right. Similarly, on real estate, you have the Bill Gates and the Jeff Bezos that are collect they're owning something around third, you know, their largest owner of farms. And you also have some invisible bank, their banks are bidding for assets and so they're going after the real assets and the real assets to the king of the castle are nanotechnology, artificial intelligence, the Microsofts, the Facebooks, and the Apples to in order to, to maximize their surveillance. And they don't need spies anymore. They have the drones, they have the internet, right? To, to watch over you. They have to continue to buy these assets and exert control in order to continue their narrative. So these are people that are not playing by the rules. And therefore, the market is going to continue to be volatile, but I don't see a crash of the equity market, neither of the real estate market. It, fundamentally, if they were to crash, they would have already, which they still haven't. That's just a word of caution for those who are shorting the market. So John, what do you, what do you expect from interest rates going forward here? Of course, many people are expecting that crash that you just said is, is you know, probably not coming which would give the Fed kind of cover to be able to cut and start printing again, whether they, you know, let's say go back to two and a half or 3% temporarily and recognize that inflation is still a problem. What do you expect from, from the Fed going forward here? Why do you think rates are going higher yet? The way I look at it, I'm a chartered financial analyst. I'm not a gold bug. You know, my parents are working for the government in Taiwan. Mother's a teacher. I, I came from the dot com industry. So to be a, to be into, to be into gold from a, a tacky working the start of my career in Silicon Valley is almost like the economy. <laughs> uh, it's it's to do if you look at fiat since 1913, the United States, the financial system has been hijacked since the creation of the Fed. The mandate of the Fed, as you talk on school, is the dual mandate of controlling inflation and maximize employment. That is a pretense. That is the cover of the storytelling. What the Fed is doing is to facilitate the accumulation of assets by the, by the top power that be, while providing that disguise of, of lower inflation, creating the fear of deflation, and keeping the market second guessing. The purpose of the Fed is to deter, oh, actually, the crowd from, from participating in the equity market to be competing with the guys that are buying the market and also deter people from buying gold and silver. That's why they're saying the gold and silver standards are barbaric relic. And that's why they're almost fixing the signals. What has happened? Everything's well planned in the last 100 years or even longer since 1913, it's been over 100 years, is to maximize the demand, is to maximize the reach to maximize uh, the debt market, to maximize the demand for the currency. So the world in the last 40 years, a debt binge is never seen in the history. I don't know how much debt is there out of 30, 50 trillion, maybe even more. Right? Just the US treasury market, I think is around 20, 30, 40 trillion. The world debt market is about $100 trillion. Uh, these are fiats. In order to create demand for fiat, which is what the power that we want, because if you print something nobody wants, you're not achieving your objective. But what they have been doing is they have induced the world to be on an absolute debt binge to the point where, remember about six years ago when nothing makes sense and the guys are bidding up treasuries at, at a premium, which means that if you're buying treasury at $120 on the on face value of a dollar at the end of the, when the debt matures, you lose 20, 20 cents on the dollar, right? So they were actually inducing, so maximizing. You remember all the days back in 2020, the, the optimal, 
asset allocation is 80% debt, remember 20% equity and 5% real estate and 2% international. The debt market is going to be designed as a parking, as a vehicle to absorb liquidity, to get people hooked on debt. The point is, what I'm driving at is, we're looking at now, we have been through ultra easing cycle by design for the last 40 years. Now they're going to maximize the pain and suffering. They're going to torch. They're going to torch the market and they're going to inflict maximum pain and suffering to achieve their objective, own nothing and be happy by 2030. And in order to do that, you got to maximize pain. They want to wipe out the middle class, which is accumulating a lot of fiat currency and wealth. And we could we can talk about why they want to, why they want to do that. And, and they're all hooked on debt. And now they're calling hold to risk. They want to, they want to go back to the era of, of the peasants and the king. <laughs> and to do that, the interest is going to get a lot, a lot higher. So, John, you you also mentioned earlier the the debt uh, the debt curve inversion here, like the the ten to two year inversion, for example. Is it we've never had it inverted for this long? Um, That's right. And, and do you think that this this signal has lost its importance in showing us that there's likely a recession coming? Or how do you see the dynamics of this inversion? Well, there's only only be a couple of times where the yield curves are inverted. I think there was in year 2000, 2005, and there's another time in financial crisis. And back in the 80s, early 1980, there's another inversion. So in modern, his, in modern monetary history, that's basically since I was born in 1974, there, the, the, the name of the game is debt binge, right? Maximize leverage, you know, provide the dosage of opioids to the world to get them hooked on it. And then, and then you're going to be followed by the inevitable withdrawal of the opioids, the dosage, which is what which is what we're doing right now. They're turning up the dial by sterilizing the market, withdrawing the market liquidity from the market, and that's why you're seeing the Fed is selling treasury. The world's way of trying to sell treasury. You take the money out of the market, and and then you the holder is treasury. You're talking about the the inverted yield curve in the two occasions since 1980 where the yield curves were inverted. That's because the market was overheating, and the Fed stepped into the market by by hiking aggressive hiking of the interest rates like in 2015 and also 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 in year 2000 they hiked the interest rate a lot to try to induce to burst modulating of the bubble and then once the bubble burst so the yield curve go a lot so the short rates go going to become higher like for example like in 2015 short is one of five or six or seven percent right six percent where the third 10 year was below five percent that you got to build the yield curve but once the bubble is burst the, the cooling started then the Fed will then backtrack and then by, by lowering the short-term rates to be below the long-term rates to normalize the yield curve. The market expecting that right now, where they're thinking that there's a lot of inflation, inflation is transitory, so the Fed is in the name of fighting inflation is raising the interest rates, but they're watching, waiting for the signs of cooling of inflation so that the Fed is gonna be lowering interest rates while the 10-year stay fairly steady. Well, you can already see something is a little different from the past. In the past, regardless of what the Fed does, the long-term interest rates on the lowering trajectory, the yields. But now you're seeing the 10 years broken out, right? So you have a 10 years that's steady climbing, and you have a two-year that's kind of a very steady at around 4.5% to 5%. More and more people are starting to realize that the yields are not coming down at the low end. Then those people, once they awaken, then they say, well, you know, maybe I'm maybe this time is indeed different. So they are starting to come to their realization. They start to get selling selling treasury. It's not so much economy driven. I mean, what is the real definition of recession? For example, it's just so hard to measure. And so I, I think by a lot of by a lot of matrix, the, the world's already in recession, such as Japan's in recession right now. And you can make a case that the U.S. is in recession. I can tell you some of the some of the indicators that we track. But I don't think any of that is going to deter the Fed from lowering interest rates. If the Fed was gearing toward lowering interest rate, it would have done so with oil seventy four dollars because oil touched all facets of the economy. You know, from 10, 2010 to twenty twenty, when average rate was two percent, average oil prices between eighty to one hundred. How do you explain that? From in the last 15 years, oil is below the 100, the average yield is 2%, and now the yield is 5%, and the Fed is talking about having to wait for inflation to, uh, you know, signs of the lower inflation to come. And, and also, you have a lot of the S&P 500. They are, in essence, a state-owned state -owned enterprise, kind of like in China. They're, they're just tentacles of the Fed already, because the Fed, the power that be already controlling 60 70% of the 
of their board. So if Tim Cook doesn't hand over the, the user data of, of who's who's whispering against the Fed or doing some untoward and toward activities, they just need to show the share register to, to Tim Cook and they would have been done with, right? So I think there's a lot of a lot of inflation is mandated by the Fed and by the power that be. And because the SP 500 has a lot more influence and price control. Now, a lot of that is, is, is centrally driven. So the thing for the government is not to control inflation. They want to manifest inflation in order to provide the pretense to hike interest rate higher. And the, re- the reason they want to go higher interest rates has got nothing to do with economy overheating or to do with higher inflation. It's simply the cause of maximizing pain and suffering and have people revert back to own nothing and be happy. And that's really the gist of it. I don't see the risk go lower. So, John, what does this all in turn mean for the dollar? And and maybe as a way of or by route of explaining that, we can start with this idea that a lot of the other central banks around the world are are you know beginning to kind of capitulate on their higher for longer rate hiking cycle versus the Fed. It's almost right. like they've the rest of the currencies have lost the battle against the Fed. You're right, Tom. Some of the Scandinavian countries are contemplating on rate hike cuts, and ECB is also talking about rate cuts. And many parts of Asia never really embarked on the aggressive rate hikes because they weren't into the woke agenda. They weren't into the carbon credits, like it's in Canada. So they never had these these levies on on, on fuels, etc. So their inflation, while it's still inflation, but it was not it was not to the tune of thirty to forty percent, right? Hiking. Rising in the last 20, 20, in the last in the last two to three years. Well, the reason that some of the central banks are start are start are starting to maybe cut rates is just they, they have less penetration by the power to do. So they, they are not as well uh harmonized and to be a better word by the power that be. Mm-hmm. So if you look at the cause of it, I mean, that's really the bottom line. And the jury is still out to see how much how, how things are gonna play out. But if you look at the power, the way the way I see higher rates, it's really one of the rare, very rare market and where a short treasury quite heavily through Oracle Commodity Holding, which is a new leadership company, investment company. That's the reason is there's very few occasions where I see the fundamentals and the technicals and the cartels of wish and desire aligning all at the same time. So what I mean by that is if you look at the metals market, gold and silver, right? The fundamentals point to higher. The technical Obviously, it's it's a lot higher than 200 day moving average now, so it's not an ideal entry point. But the cartels don't want the higher metal prices, so you're always working against the cartel. That's why I see a lot of volatility, it's like we saw in the last two weeks. And that's why I said like you gotta have a little bit more appetite, stomach volatilities to be into the metals market. But to short treasury, I think right now, especially with the treasury minor correction in the last few days, with the talk about the Fed maybe lowering rates again, I think we're in an excellent entry point to be shorting the treasury, to be lowering the yields. Because the yields is at a 200-day moving average support, and which means that the treasury is at a 200-day moving average resistance, and the yields pointing higher from the 40-year 30 yield, 40-year yield bear market, and the cartels want a higher yields, and then fiats they eventually they worth nothing. So the yield interest rate eventually is when people all wake up. This Ponzi scheme, the yields going to be a lot higher. So it's one of the rare instances where I see the yields a lot higher going forward. Mm-hmm. John, you mentioned this idea of kind of being short treasuries by being long commodities. And the last time we spoke, you you were talking about how demographics can kind of derail the, the commodity super cycle. Have you come to any different understanding or study anymore the, the demographics problem that we're facing? You know, I've I've had a demographics expert on the show. And I think that's a, a really important piece of the puzzle to try to to try to account for in a lot of these situations. Well, in the end, people consume commodities and and they also in civilized in, in advanced countries, consumer spending controls 66% of the economy. Even in China, it's gone surpassed 50%. So it's important to understand the demographics. And, and if you look at Japan, right, who's had, had endured fallen demographics and, and, and they, and then, so there was, so in the last 20, 30 years, the economy has been treading water. Mm-hmm. My view on the world population, according to the, the world population meters at 8 billion, I don't think, I don't think we're anywhere close to that. 
There are some scholars from Japan that were that were have been studying the Chinese population, and their conclusion is China is now firmly under a billion people from the studies of salt consumption. You cannot really uh, take the government's figures for granted, and government will also inflate their population figures because the government subsidy from school vouchers from from counties subsidies all hinges on. Population count, right? Even for boats for different states, there, there's there's inclination incentive to to inflate the population count. But the basic premise of salt consumption in China indicated that China's population is is at least twenty percent below what its estimates are, um, and it's not easy to calculate world populations either. I think in some estimates the world is not even five billion people, and there is some evidence in that. Like I said, if you look at the oil price right now. There is a definitely a disconnect between the equity markets and the oil price. Mm-hmm. If the markets, equity markets like S and P five hundred and like the Japanese and the Brazilians and many parts of the world, Taiwanese market, there are raging bull market right now, reaching all time high. You should be seeing a company commodity market that are marrying to that trend, mm-hmm. and but which is not the case with oil seventy four, palladium is less than a thousand, zinc is at the doldrum, even copper is even though gold is. Gold last time copper is five dollar. Gold is a thousand. Gold is two thousand. But copper is still not breaking out five dollar. It just broke out recently to, by twenty. Now it's, it seems to be a fake breakout. It's a, so my it's a, on that it's is, a nominal. It's a nominal high, but you know, inflation adjusted, it, it's not it's low. that impressive. Right. That just shows that tells me that the people are not the people are by the consuming less. Either the people are consuming less, or there's less people consuming. <laughs> I think it's a combination of both. And now you're seeing like the likes likes of Starbucks. You know they're they're announcing warnings earnings and and a lot of shoes are dropping right now, even even the apples of the world. So you know this is gonna continue. Your question is how it's gonna affect uh, uh, the view on commodities. It's a mixed mixed view. I'm not bearish on commodity per se, and the reason for that is not because I'm bearish on the demand, but rather on the industrial demand. But rather I am I'm very bearish bearish on the industrial demand of metals. But I am bullish on the investment demand of metals. So what I mean by that, for example, gold, of which I'm very bullish of, is almost purely investment demand. That's 90%, 99%, right? Mm-hmm. So I'm bullish on that because you are swimming in the sea of liquidity. So those, those money has to go somewhere. Mm-hmm. So that is positive. Then if you look at the on the other end, there's really not an investment demand quote unquote, for oil, because it can't really store that much oil. That's why I'm not bullish on oil. That's why you see oil is $74, even though the supply is being, is being cartel from all parts of the world, including the United States, banned frack, fracking. But whereas, say, for silver, which has been a bit lagger, then which is 70% industrial and 30% investment, that's why you see silver should have well broken out $30 already when gold took out 2000 in January. It hasn't done that. It's been quite weak, weaker than I expected. Part of that is precisely, precisely because uh, of China undergoing a financial crisis to the same magnitude as it was in the mortgage crisis of U.S. in 2009, mm-hmm. and where where over trillion dollar down defaults, and and you have a wholesale mortgage defaults all over China, and you seeing you seeing home prices are down 20, 30, even 50 percent in rural parts of China. So that put a damper on the industrial demand. Same for copper. So I'm just going to see this continued struggle. Or a sort of dichotomy for base for base metal commodities between the demand destruction, like I talked about in the last time on the show, versus supply disruption. It's a matter of you know is supply coming on faster than the de- demand drop, and also is the event investment demand catching up faster than than the indus- industrial demands decline. Mm-hmm. John, obviously, I want to. I want to come back to these topics that we've kind of touched on with gold and silver here, but a question I asked a guest recently, and I think you'll have a, an interesting perspective on this, is it's so hard to get an accurate picture of the the health of the Chinese economy. There, You read one story and it's ultra bearish. You read another story and it's ultra bullish. And there's all of these conflicting reports. So to what extent do you think that China puts out Miss or disinformation to underscore or under underwhelm everybody in the world on what their actual financial health or economic health actually is, and is that you know very deliberate on their part? 
Xi, Xi Jinping's model is very, very different from Deng Xiaoping and Jiang Zemin and Hu Jintao and Wen Jiabao. So Hu Jintao and, and Xi Jinping, uh, so Hu Jintao and Wen Jiabao and Jiang Zemin, which is the opening up of China in the last 70 years, they see capitalist and capitalism as it's almost like it's it's kind of like flies, right? It's it's it kind of it's a nuisance, but it's kind of somewhat needed. So they see it as just a annoyance and but it's kind of needed. But whereas Xi Jinping has different kind of thought, he is a diehard firm. The, the Deng Xiaoping's and the Jiang Zemin's and Hu Xintao, Wen Jiabao, these are they're not true hard Marxists. They are they're just they're trying to kind of like exert control. They just maintain the status quo. You don't rock the boat. Everything's just kind of status quo, and then and then accumulate some wealth for my hairs. And you know, don't don't rock the boat. But but Xi Jinping and and now the guys that are controlling the U.S. and and the Europe. They are diehard Marxists. To answer your question, I don't think Xi Jinping care jack out about what the Western people of the world are thinking. And there, and these people, just like the U.S., they really, really don't care about the welfare of the middle class and the population. All they want is to go back to the 1920s. And the reason they want that, their mentality is the common suffering. <laughs> it's that everybody should be half hungry so that you would appreciate the food and the providing that I give you. And But the problem we have today is you have the rising middle class and these people are annoyed um, when they are being crowded with traffic when they go holiday in Venice, or they when go windsurfing in in South Africa in Cape Town, or they they're just so bothered when when they try to celebrate at, at Times Square and they don't they, they couldn't find a place to set their foot on. They want to dial back to hundred years ago, and it's nothing more. It's not like they don't have enough to eat or feed themselves, but they're they just they they just, they're bored. They're just bored. And they're just not seeing the level of compliance that they used to. They want to go back to the Marxist era where everybody's half empty, half full, so they, they're compliant. China is not going to care about China. They don't care. Like they're talking about the quote unquote internal circulation and their, their computers are not, they don't have any more Microsoft now. They're not Apple's or Intel chips. They really don't care about if anything they want to dial up a notch. And the only the way to do that is war, kind of like Germany in, under Hitler. In order to sort of attain the domestic quarrels is to stir nationalism, to create bigger problems in order to bury the lower problems. In talking about propaganda, about disguising GDP and, and inflation and all these different employment numbers, I don't think the U.S. is, is any better. Well, I think right, right now, the Fed and the gov U.S. government, the, the narrative, the storyline is they want to print higher inflation numbers. They want to print higher employment numbers. They want to print higher home sales numbers. They want to print higher GDP in order to provide that reasoning for higher interest rates. And the reason when they go higher interest rates is so that maximum pain and suffering could be inflicted so that the middle class will all nothing be happy. John, returning to what we were talking about when it comes to gold and silver, yes. what is your theory on the silver to gold ratio? And then has this changed because of silver being much more of an industrial metal now than a monetary metal? Well, silver has always been an industrial metal. I mean, the ratio of the industrial to monetary is always been about 70-30. The gold-to-silver the gold -to ratio has been persistently high from historical average, which is 70. But the ratio has been always been elevated from to the 80 to 100 level. It's actually went over 100. It's never went over 100, only a couple of times. So it went over 100 in, in the pandemic where gold went to 2000 and silver was silver was was uh, in the low teens so i mean that that ratio was was close to 100 when a $2000 gold and less than $20 silver right? i think went to 105 or 110 silver is very hard to predict because the investment demand for silver and the investment demand is always the principal driver of any commodity bull mm -hmm. because in a commodity bull market the industrial usage is going to drop with the higher prices they're trying to buy substitutes they buy less so there's less demand with higher prices. But investment demand is the opposite. When the prices go higher, more people come in to buy more. Mm -hmm. And the same for real estate. It's never the income to the price ratio that's drive the market, right? It's always the investment demand mm -hmm. that drive the real estate market. Right? And same for everything else. So it's hard to gauge the investment demand for silver, when they're going to come and how much they're going to come. 
because it's all it's only 300 million ounces at $30 silver is it's, it's 10 billion dollars it's dropping the bucket that's why that's why silver market is always very very hard to gauge when it's going to take off but before it does and as i said on the show two and a half years ago then the market can stay stay irrational longer than you can stay solar let me tell you the bearish case for solar which is the lackluster invest industrial usage industrial physical industrial usage that's one problem because of demographics and then secondly, also that silver is such a small market. It's not for the players of the Jeff Bezos and Warren Buffett's and the and the Putins and the Xi Jinping's and central banks. It's too small. So the problem is if the retail appetite is lower because of less demographics, the dwindling, diminishing demographics, and then you have the industrial demand that's also putting a lid on silver, in my view, even though they still have the advanced electronics or solar, for example. But if you look at per unit of silver going into a solar panel, it went down 70% in the last three years. And same with electronics. Like I haven't changed my phone in three years. My computer I'm talking to is five years old. For the basics, unless you play computer games, right? You don't need these advanced things. And the, I mean, the grid is aging, but then if people are dying, if the world is half of what it will be, if the world half, you know, five, 10 years from now is half of what it is today, you don't need a lot more grid than you do today. It's very hard call on silver. If you can stop my volatilities, now it's, it's a fair price to, to be buying. But I would not put all my baskets in silver, certainly not in silver mining companies, but rather I'm buying more gold than I'm doing with silver for the first time since 2015. We we'll started buying metals again and we all we bought is gold. Another thing is because gold in Asia has has less tariffs and export tariffs, where silver, they, they have a lot more different taxation regimes that are being imposed on it. So overall, I, I like gold a little better than silver, but if you have that appetite, risk appetite, right? Mm -hmm. Silver eventually, if it runs and when it runs, will obviously can potentially outpace gold based on the gold to silver ratio. So right now, I think gold to silver ratio is around 80, which is high, but let me say it again, I would not always be banking on that ratio going to 30 or lower, which is indicator of a, of a peak in the prior silver blowouts. And because just speaking from experience, I remember when the, our companies were buying, looking for platinum assets to buy, and we, we bought a platinum project in 2011, and platinum and gold was both at around 1300. And I was like, whoa. Historically, platinum is trading at 50% premium to, to gold, right? So, so at $13.00 gold, the platinum should be at 2000 So if you were writing on that thing, you would have been turned upside down. You want to be careful of these ratios because, you know, there's subtle nuances that, that, are, that are different over time. So I, I, I'm less bullish on silver than I was before, purely because silver is underperformance. And the reason for the underperforming on the demographics, on the retail participation, on the industrial demand, I think the, these factors, bearish factors, going to continue to persist. So, John, obviously, you said you've, in in a way, switched a bit of your stance on gold, on it's, silver, bullish like, on gold, less bullish on silver. Let's say, let's say the the balance between the two, right? Do you do you see gold as basically the the bridge of value to transport that value from this monetary system to whatever comes next? The crowd is too stupid. Even my mother, when I asked her to put to put my, our savings in gold, so of course, well, my mother said, okay, this is your money, right? Okay, so mom, if you really mean that, and she's 80, she's over she's 81, then I want my money to be in gold. So she reluctantly agreed. We went to the banks. And the banks is like, I want physical gold. So why do you want physical gold? You can buy this gold passport, which you, which you can buy a spot. But if you buy gold, these gold bars yeah. and, and, and gold coins, you're paying... Gold bars anywhere three to seven percent premium, and gold coins are at anywhere from five to fifteen percent premium. Mm -hmm. So my mom and they're, they're looking at they're staring. I said, "Well, you know, this is why are you buying gold, right? This is not Chinese New Year. You are you going to a wedding or are you like have some event, like a fest, some sort of festive events?" It's like no. So everybody's dumbfounded, including my mother. Gold is not going to go back to the 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 standard of which money is transacted also because gold is too volatile it's not possible but I do see gold playing a role as a wealth a store of wealth not necessarily as a currency per se but as a store of wealth kind of like real estate right sometimes you buy real estate not because you are flipping or trying to make money it's just kind of like I don't really it doesn't really matter in in Asia it's just you have condos you rent there or not it's, it's just sitting there right and then and then your children take over so it's it's just it's just it's it's just a store of wealth. 
And the reason I see gold going a lot higher, potentially over $6,000 by 2030, is not to do with inflation. It's to do with the diversification from central banks and from the central banks and from the well-to-dos. The central banks are taking notice of the $300 billion confiscation of the Russian money and subsequently having the Russia cut off the SWIFT system, basically at the flip of a switch. So the politicians there are kind of concerned that if, if they run a file with whatever, for whatever reason, they, they don't want to be seen as the, as the goal, scapegoat, right? And then that would be their, their Achilles heel for their professional career. They have worked hard for 20, 20, 30, 40 years to get to where they are, being the PM or the Fed governor, whatever it is. So there's definitely diversification of into gold by all the central banks around the world. I just want to put in real quick, the second point is, it's inevitable and imminent that the of the adaptation of the digital currency. So in that scenario, you have a lot of the billionaires, the Sentai billionaires, the Coates brothers, the Elon Musk, the, the Jeff Bezos, even the Warren Buffett's, or the chairman of Zara or, or, or you know, Bernard of LBMA. They're seeing the writing on the wall. They don't want to be participating in this game of digital currency and, and carbon credits being told where you can go, what you can buy, <laughs> where you can buy and, and what you cannot buy and what you can eat and, and what not and what not. There's only one way to get out of that system, which is physical gold and silver. And if you think that you can take your grandma's phone, right, to to indulge on a steak, which you cannot anymore because you flew too much and consumed too much carbon credits in flying. Well, bad news for you. Like I flew from Seattle to Houston. I I was told to put my face in front of a monitor. I did, and it's, oh, John Lee, green, right? You can proceed. I am not even a U.S. citizen. They didn't even look at my boarding pass. I bought my ticket online through Trip.com, which is a Chinese-owned company. Like, how could they How could they ever know who I am and what I'm doing? And unfortunately, everything is all stored in a global centralized database. And eventually, you're, you're going to have to... You're going to have to scan your iris or fingerprint for, for everything you buy and to eat and everywhere you go. And if, it's, if you say something entirely or if you, if you do something that, you know, they're not liked, you're, just, you're going to be taken off the grid and there's nothing you can do. There's nobody you can go to appeal. There's no escalate. It's not like I want to talk to your manager, right? Get me to your manager, right? You, you cannot escalate and you're screwed. And to get through that, you need some gold and silver in your, in your bunker, this is not, this might seem funny or even comical or, you know, a bit, uh, a bit, you know, a bit funny, but, but it's not. Tom, we're quickly getting to that point. It's not that far. The digital euro is going to be in place on a trial basis next year. That's why you want to buy gold and silver. Because that, if you were to, under that scenario, Tom, you cannot even go to Kitco and buy gold and silver anymore. These purchases will be flagged. Just like when you need to transfer $100,000 from Hong Kong, like if your bank, if your bank in Canada, Tom, in Calgary, would you receive $100,000 from Hong Kong, it will 100% be flagged. We know that because we have investors investing in our company. Same, if you're going to, if you're going to, if you're going to wire $10,000 to Kitco, it's going to be flagged mm -hmm. as, as a form of digital currency. So surveillance is already in place. And with the advent of AI, adoptive uh, artificial intelligence, coupled with micro digital currency and the computing power. We don't need banks anymore. <laughs> All these banks were because the central bank, the Fed, right, were, were not able to manage. So they were having the JP Morgans, the Wells Fargo's, the Bank of America, and then you had the union banks and the regional banks. They don't need any of that anymore. They can manage the 5 billion people from one database, which is a scary thought. And that's the reason I'm more bullish on gold and silver. And let me finish my thought there. Imagine in that world of surveillance where you need, a, you, need, you need a fingerprint, you need a facial recognition to ride a bus, to board a plane, to eat a meal, to buy some gas in the convenience store. Think about if you have an American Eagle or, or a Maple Leaf, my aunt's silver. These people would gladly uh, accept that money regardless of what the monetary print on that coin is. So let me give an example. If, if I'm at the gas station, I'm I'll, if, as an owner, I'll be so fed up with this micro mandates. Like it was like, my God, yesterday I tried to order ribeye and they, I got a beep. Sorry, you you had a ribeye two weeks ago and your carbon credit is, is, is finished. Mm -hmm. He's going to take your silver coin for $100 worth of gas. 
that you pumped, even though the silver might print $55. You know why? Because he can take that silver coin, go to Ruth's Chris or Morton's, and he knows, right? That silver coin is good. Mm -hmm. And and that is the world we're going to go into. I see that five, five years away. Not even that. And the gold and silver, the way you should look at it, you know, I'm passionate about it every time I care about gold and silver, which hopefully your audience could resonate, is this is another example. You know, there's a lot of Michelin restaurants, mm -hmm. like uh, Michelin five stars. And you say, okay, I call Tom Steakhouse, Palisade, Palisade Grill Bar, Palisade Grill. I say, <laughs> hey, Palisade Grill, right? I want a table for four. Wow. Right tomorrow, my birthday, and they're gonna say, "I'm sorry, this is a members club only." It doesn't really matter what the menu prices are printed. It's just you're. It's not available for you. Mm -hmm. And this is this. I want to be very clear. This is the world we're gonna go into in five years. You're buying gold and silver, particularly numismatics, because I compare the numismatics bullions is like a bunch of steels, steel scrapes, and Rolex, a Rolex, right? You know, like there's talk about if you're in the jungle in Africa, and then if, if you go on a plane, there's five seats and there's six people. That is where your Rolex comes in handy. You see what I mean? Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, in the world of surveillance, where not every not everybody's created equal, to get into that Michelin Club restaurant, to, that coin is going to come in handy. Even though it's printed, it's like the menu printing the sticks is $30. But that's a you can order that stick for 30 right? So that's going to be the world we're going on. You want to absolutely load up on the maple leaves, on the American Eagles, on the one ounce, on the silvers, on the gold. You use the gold to buy homes, to buy big purchase ticket items like cars, used cars. And you you do this, you take the silver coin for your every day, your gas, your meals. And this is the world that I see. And you know, at that time, it's not about, it's, it's not even so much about how much you, money you're worth because even for me and some people audience, when you are seven figures, additional money doesn't going to give you its diminishing return on utilities, right? So it's not. It's, it's a matter of doing what you want want to do whenever you want to do, and and how much you want to do it. And you don't want you don't want that to be handicapped. And the only way to the only way for that not to happen is to buy gold and silver metal. I just cannot emphasize that strongly enough. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. So John, you know, we're talking a lot about you know in a way, uncertainties. And I think a big piece of uncertainty that isn't priced into the markets right now is the election. How do you see that affecting the, the markets? Because markets tend to hate uncertainty. Yes. Election is a misnomer. It's a, it's a typo. Uh, it's a grammar error. It's, it's, a, it's, it's what I call, it's not what I call, it's a Dr. Shiva, it's an Indian guy, well-liked well internet figure. He called it it's a selection process, not the election process. The candidates are nominated all somewhat de defective, right? If you look at the last four or five presidents on both sides of the aisle, we have John Kerry on the Republican side or, or John McCain, the Bush, which is run by the CIA and FBI. So it doesn't really matter whether it was Democrat side or Republican side. So it's, I don't see it making a difference. Everybody has a price, Tom. So there are some... There are some presidents that have a better conscience, but so they 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 can they they cannot stop the inevitable, but they can just delay the inevitable. Mm -hmm. So, like digital currency is an example, right? There are some candidates out there. I said they're not gonna they're not into the idea, but then if, if the Democrats to be elected, you're gonna see the adoption of that much faster. And then you also see a very clear example. Also, if you look at the prime ministers of UK. You're seeing a wholesale change over every what six months or every every twelve months, and that's why because because the prime minister is not the, the ones calling the shots. You have the Johnsons, you have the the uh, Theresa, and you have the, you know different ones, right? It, eventually, you got a WEF diehard, <laughs> and so I don't think elections is making a difference. I don't think the election is, is going to make a difference on the equity market. Basically, as I mentioned to you, that we're near the end of the cycle and the actions by the power that be are a lot more blatant. They're literally just printing and buying now. Mm -hmm. And so the equity actions are not sensitive to interest rates as they were or even sensitive to the economies. I don't I don't think it's going to be any factors on, on the... Uh, I mean, every now and then you might see abrupt corrections in the in the equity markets, and but that would just be, be an engineer correction to try to cool the market and just try to attain the market per se. But 
Um, we can talk about equity, mar- you know, mining shares and gold gold prices. They are very heavily managed. I would say even for a small company like Silver Elephant, on a normal given day, probably eighty percent of the shares are algo driven, and just like eighty percent of the uh, trading of the equity market, the energy market, gold and silver market, the currency market, it's all much algo driven. And there is a path of which the managers. The cartels want the market to have gravity towards, but there is also a natural path of what the market wants to go. In the case, in the case of equity, the cartels want to accumulate equities while to try to sort of control the prices, not to go parabolic. And the interest rate, the cartels want the interest to go a lot higher. And obviously, both for gold and silver, they want to go hold control, sort of manage gold and silver for as long as possible. John, how do you also see the risk of more conflict in the world? You know, of course, being from Taiwan, you have a unique perspective on the risk and let's say potential of China's interest there. The world is a lot more fragile than people think. I would talk, I'll dive into war, but you know, there's talk about, I think I was on another show yesterday, Warren Buffett shared with you into a dollar, right? A flash crash. And then Las Vegas, only two months ago, for those who live in Vegas, know that the entire ATM system was shut down for several days. And then you have major regional blackouts of power, Pakistan and elsewhere, even in California. My thoughts is this, if a plane can disappear in the middle of nowhere, in a world that's been blanketed by by satellites and GPS, you can easily, I mean, it is not a black swan event to fathom the possibility of some event where literally you're just, your money in your bank account just wiped out. Like, I'm sorry, you'll call Wells Fargo, you will have an automated AI. I'm sorry, we are investigating, apologize for the inconvenience, and we'll call you back as soon as possible. We're Thank having you. A, a higher number you just of volume stop. of uh, calls right now. <laughs> yeah, you just, you're like, you're, you're just like, where's my money? And there's no, nobody knows where it is. Mm-hmm. And then you just don't, you just have no idea what happened. It could very well be some alien came and just disrupted these signals and then the, the banking system just went belly up. And that was that. So I just want to share how fragile the system is. Now, on the war, it's going to get worse, a lot worse, unfortunately. I can talk about Ukraine and Russia, which I kind of started getting interest in looking into it again, having a bit of free time in, in, because our minds are finally going to do, you know, almost commercial production stage. And also the Chinese attack on Taipei, on Taiwan, which is a real possibility because the world is run by lunatics right now. <laughs> Their rationale is not democracy versus communism, freedom versus lack of freedom. What they're after is control. They want to control. They want control. Mm-hmm. And Tom, the, how the wars are fought, I want to share with you. They are fought by drones. So there is on the internet. I just watched literally last week. There is a Chinese mercenary, mercenary hired by the Russians to fight in the in the war fronts of Ukraine. Mm-hmm. The average. Time for a live person on the battlefield is 12 hours. These are 24 7 warfare. This is not like the wars before where everybody's okay. We have, we have a ceasefire between eight o'clock to five o'clock, right? And then we're going to start again. Everybody take like a five hour break. This is a 24 hour war guerrilla. Once they dropped off by the parachutes, they see a sea of black sea of drones literally descending. They're kamikaze drones and they're drones that carry missiles. These drones, and, and it's unfortunate, these, the world is going to be fought with these drones. And, and it's going to be a battlefield. And the prices are a very artificial. The prices are, is a very, the stakes are getting higher. It's like, okay, I'm going to draw this line. You cannot cross this line. And then eventually you cross the line. See what happened? Nothing happened. The cross the line is, you cross my line, I cross your line. Kind of like U.S. now, it's okay, my weapons can now go into Russia territory, but within 10 kilometers from the border, right? And then they're going to see that, well, if the Russia doesn't pull the trigger on the nuclear, okay, I'm going to go 20 kilometers in, right? And the Russia is, okay, I'm going to go not just Ukraine and Poland, and what are you going to do about it? And then what happened is the prices are artificial border lines, which bears no significance whatsoever. But these people are just crazy and so bored. They are just bored. They're literally, there's not no other descriptive than other than they're just bored. They're just like, hey, kind of like what you watch that movie of 007 with the guy that's running the Abel Empire that's shooting a missile, a, a, a torpedo of the submarine and see what happens, right? This is kind of their phrase mindset. They just got bored. They want some actions. 
I mean, in Taiwan, China can easily have a aircraft carrier just alone, like just just a carrier, right? And it's alone, few thousand drones. You can take out the power, take out the water, take out the Taipei 101, take out the President Palace and some of the landmarks within six hours, and and then see what happens. And then see what happens. That's raised the stakes. And then now, you know, is is F-16 is going to dispatch with American armed military uh, uh, arms descending onto Beijing and Shanghai and Shenzhen and Hong Kong or, and Macau? We don't know. Maybe at, not at the start, but the stakes are the stakes are higher. And you know, you can easily have some rogue element pulling some trigger by accident or otherwise, which is very very scary. And in parallel to that thought, Tom, I think the enemy and what people should be concerned about is not, at least for the United States, it's not so much the war is going to be extended from the Ukrainian border, you know, eventually to onshore of the United States or New York, right? It's never going to happen. Mm -hmm. But what you should be concerned about as Canadian and U.S. is, is the possibilities of having these drones controlled by the Pakistani mercenaries in India that's shooting bullets on the Patriots is marching towards Ottawa and Washington, D.C. <laughs> You'll be surprised of how easy it is to overturn a ter tyrannical government. I've seen that with real scenario. I was in Bolivia when that happened or in the Civil War, Tiananmen Square in, 19 in 1980s, when you have barely a few thousand students stood in front of Tiananmen Square in front of a tank. That was scary enough to force Deng Xiaoping to load his gold and silver and his Rolls Royce on the 7th on 3747 and ready to jet to Washington, D.C., right? Same with Marco Polo's, Gandhi Sanchez. Every time you, it doesn't take a whole lot, but it's always the police mutiny that was able to overturn the government because the countrymen cannot, in their conscience, to lay arms, to fire, to, with, to the patriots. People know who's right and wrong. But the scary scenario is that with the advent of AI and, and the drones and the bots, unfortunately, the real bad people are hiding behind the scenes. They're not even your countrymen. And, and they're just, they're outside, right? They're, they're in South Africa somewhere. They're just, they're just, you know, doing their toggles. I see a grim picture. It's, it's unfortunate that, that the cartels have upper hands on the media, on the, on the militaries, on the borders, on the executive branch, on the judicial branch, seeing what happened with, President Trump, I'm not a big fan of him, but I think the U.S. before it was, you know, there's there's a line to be drawn on how far you go, right? But now it's all it's all free for all. It's getting really, really ugly. And I would say diversify, have some gold and silver holdings, have different home bases outside of where you live. And uh, when things are not going the right way, you gotta you gotta be ready for an exit strategy. Have a plan B to be able to set up somewhere else and operate. You don't want to stick your neck out there. My view on that is either you do something about it or or you have a plan B, right? You watch the movie, but you guard the exit closely. Yeah. It's very unfortunate what the paths are heading towards. It's, I don't think there's much we can do about it to revert back to, you know, having gold and silver as currency, the second amendment, the freedom of speech and the fair elections and, and so on and so forth. I think it's all, we're at the terminal stage. Well, on that, on that somber note, John, <laughs> <laughs> I think that's a, a good place to wrap up. Do you do you have anything that you want to leave our listeners to to think about, to consider as we do wrap up? As I mentioned to you, Tom, for those people who are for those who are over fifty, and it's it's a little shocking because I am I am not qualified for retirement visa in certain Asian countries. I think sometimes you got to come to a point of of inflection, reflection, right, epiphany that. It's not so much going after more money, more more digits, like we have been doing in the last twenty years. It's it's about protecting your nest egg uh, and maintain your status quo, maintain your standards of living, and whether whether that's fly to places you want, eat the food you want, if you travel for a living, or seeing the people you want to see, you want to really preserve. You want to buy gold and silver, and you want to have different bases. Oh, in South America, in Asia, in Africa, wherever you're comfortable. You, you want to really start that, you know, think five or 10 years out and you want to have a plan B. You certainly don't want to leave all your money within what two or three bank accounts. That's like dollars. Mm -hmm. And you certainly don't want to have 
all your, all your real estate in the United States. It's like, if you don't pay your, I forgot to pay my taxes up in my Vegas condo for 12 months. They are putting a lien and they're ready for close. And you know, that's $4,000. And the taxes now is over 1%. Mm-hmm. So it, like, it's not, I'm shutting my real estate portfolio. I am shutting some of my equity holdings. I'm buying more gold and silver. And uh, even, even even just, you know, showing up a dollar holding just some money at different places. So I would say deleverage. I would not betting. I would not bet on lower interest rates and start speculating on uh, lower lower mortgage in the coming days. And with the demographics issue, I, I'm not a big fan of real estate, but then the cartels are buying real estate. So I think if you have some unique real estate propositions, you can keep like New York or you know in the middle of the action. But if you look at Japan, I was talking to my Japanese friend. Their houses are just abandoned. You can buy it for like a thousand dollars. Same in, with Italy. And unfortunately, that's a trend going in Korea, in Taiwan, where just their places just like nobody lives there and the home just abandoned. So I am not a big fan of real estate as I was, especially especially a rising interest environment. So I would I will watch the movie, enjoy the show. I'm not saying you know hide under the bunker, but I will guard the exit closely, and then uh, eventually just the plug to that. I think the mining shares and and the metal prices are still ha- very heavily managed, and there's still a lot of upside. Um, and and uh, you know for, for for your audience are into speculating has a little risk appetite can also look into silver elephant we have 100 million ounces of silver in the ground that's in production generating revenue I don't want to spend also I mean Tom in conclusion a couple of minutes about one topic I want to talk about how how high I see gold and silver prices go in in the long term I think in the short term gold, silver can go to 28 25 dollar which is the 200 day moving average it's entirely a possibility with the rising dollar and then with the seasonality. Gold, gold is probably, gold is 200, but the moving average is 20, 20, 80, 2100. The 50 day moving average is right now at 2345. So there's a possibility that gold can go below 2340 to go to the, the low 2200 possibility. Possibly. I don't say go below 2200 because of, as I mentioned to you, the diversification, the well to do's, the accumulating physical. Going long term. So once gold, if gold to go to 2300, then silver is going to make a run past 20, past 32, maybe 50. That's that is sort of a six months to 18 months prognosis. On the longer term, I see gold to go to around 6,000. Silver can go to well over 100 to 200. And the way I, I come to that numbers, as I was thinking in the last show I did yesterday, is if you look at how gold went from $30 to 800 in 1970s, you have wars and you have the close of the, of the gold window in 1972 or 1971. And, and the gold went from 30 to 800 is the result of the money printing from the 1950s and 1960s. So even though under before then, the gold price is still pegged explicitly, you didn't have anything. You don't have a lot of people that's tendering their gold because everybody is thinking that the dollar is good for $30 for the, for the word for it. So not many people redeem me dollar for gold. But why short, short the gold came and say, here's my billion dollar, where's my gold? And then that broke the gold window, basically. Have forced the Nixon right to to sever the window. So what we have in 2020 is the exact same scenario. Even though there's not an ex- ex- explicit conversion of the gold, but everybody was on a binge of the Nasdaq on the real estate market. So people are not really people are just thinking gold is a barbaric relic. The way I see it is you have the 1980 to 2000, the 20 years that binge of asset accumulation on my aggregate money expansion, just like 1950s, 60s. And then to the explosion in gold price in 1970. What we have today is very similar. So if we were to measure from 1970 to 1980 in 10 years, gold went from 35 to 800, which is 25 X. So if you were to base gold price this run, 250, which is the bottom for gold in, in 2000, when Gordon Brown dumped that two, batch of gold in, in 2001, then the, the price for gold would be uh, 25 times 250, would be 6,250. And then if you look at, interestingly, the breakout, this breakout of 2000 is very significant because it takes over 12 years to overcome that level. So we're, we're embarking on this final trajectories from 2000 to $6,000 level. Of course, it's not going to go straight up. Likely, it's going to go from 2000 to 2800 which is the cup and handles on the log scale with the $2,000 as a neckline and the 1600 as at the bottom of the cup. But then, and then gold is going to top at 2800 possibly in the next six to 12 months. And after that, we might we might stagnate stagnate for another two to three years, and then before the eventual blow off to six thousand, around twenty thirty. So that is sort of 
And the outlook nice. And then silver, like I said, it's such a small market, right? Once you go for 30, you can go past 50. Once you go past 50, then go to 100 to 200. It really depends on who's going to tip, tip their toe into, into the physical silver market. And they're, they'll be very careful about it because they know that if they're not careful about it, they're going to get a call. If they have to place an order on COMEX delivery, you know, you're going to get a call not from the delivery man of DHL. You're going to get a call from the Fed and asking if you're a terrorist, right? And why, why are you buying silver? Why are you buying gold? So I think that for people that are, they're going to have to be brave enough and they haven't exhausted all, all other options mm-hmm. and, and to stick their neck into the gold and silver market. Not saying not that not, they won't. They could and they will, like they're doing with gold right now. But silver is just too small for the big players right now to make right. a play at. Excellent. Well, I think that's a, a good a good note to to wrap up on, John. Where can our audience find more of your your work? Thank you, Tom, for your time. Look me up at in my Twitter. Just go to John Lee Silver Elephant, and then you can first search me. We got about three thousand followers, and I usually tweet once or twice a week. Mm-hmm. I, I'm not used as I don't tweet as much as I used to. I used to write Kitco every week. I've authored hundreds of articles since 2000. So you can see my stuff on the charts on interest rates on gold and on silver. And my call on, on interest rate is 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 going up. And on gold, January 2024, as when gold is 2000, I said, you got to buy gold today in January. And, and the, my target is 2400. I said to sell gold and, and mining shares in April, in May, respectively, selling May and walk away. We're not going all in right now. I think seasonality is playing against us. It has to be seen whether whether gold and silver can carry on the momentum. If not, we're probably going to have to wait for September when gold when when dollar is showing some signs of weakness. I think dollar one hundred four can easily go to one hundred eight, even one ten. So we just got to wait a little more more patient on the seasonality and and uh, and and for the dollar to exhibit a bit of a poppy a weakness. And then so, but 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 we're still maintaining a healthy holding right on the physical side because you never know. It, you know, it could be, it's just one or two events, you know, they could turn everything upside down, mm-hmm. given the precarious nature of what we are. Absolutely. Excellent, John. Well, I really appreciate your time today and look forward to speaking with you in the future. Thank you. This podcast is for general informational purposes only. Nothing on this podcast should be taken as investment advice. Guests on this show are not compensated for their appearance. Listeners are urged to educate themselves and make their own decisions. Do not base any investment decisions on the information contained. To view our full disclaimer, please visit our website.